I love my Nintendo 64. So much so that it's been in storage for nearly three years. Uh, um, uh, well, now that it's out, I can enjoy wonderful games like uh, Super Mario 64, or The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, or, or how about, how about Donkey Kong 64? Eh, well, no, that was kind of tedious, but it did come with the expansion pack, so I can enjoy a game like The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. And my friends and I always got a kick out of Mario Party and, of course, Super Smash Brothers. But, as any Nintendo 64 user knows, all this fun comes at a price. The Nintendo 64 controller's analog stick made it a joy to play 3D games for the first time. Of course, it could also really tear your hand up playing Mario Party. But the problem is that it would quickly and inevitably wear out and get loose, and you'd be left with a difficult-to-control game, and a bunch of suspicious white powder in the crevices of your analog dish. If only this control stick was as tight as the new one on this controller. But actually, this red controller is just as old as the gray one, and until a few days ago, was just as loose. It turns out there's a simple and effective way of getting your N64 controller sticks back in shape, and I'm going to show you how. I am by no means the first person to come up with this method. Two videos on YouTube that I saw that showed me how are from Gam Man and Dog in My Lens, although I'm sure there are countless others out there as well. But getting the stick fixed is almost as fun as just getting to explore the insides of an N64 controller and to learn how this futuristic piece of analog greatness actually works and why it is that it stops working as well. So you'll need an N64 controller, a screwdriver, preferably magnetic, some tape, I'll be using scotch tape, but I've heard packing tape and plumber's tape work as well, some scissors, and a Q-tip or other small cleaning device. I have a small cotton square. Turn your N64 controller on its back and unscrew every screw. There are seven along the grips in the center and an additional slightly smaller two screws at the bottom of the expansion port. Once those are all out, the fun may begin. Pull it off and, wow, controller guts! And all the buttons have buttons! Under the plastic buttons you actually touch are rubber buttons that are on top of the actual circuits. The L and R plastic buttons are particularly prone to falling off while the back is unattached, so you might just want to take them off and set them aside. Just remember that the pegs on the back of them fit easily into these tiny holes. Now, as you can see, the analog assembly is an entirely separate piece from everything else, and all of our work will be inside of it. So, we have to get the analog assembly away from the controller. First off, given the proximity of the Z button to the analog stick on the finished controller, you'll learn that the Z button is actually attached to the analog assembly like a leech. So, we'll have to get that off as well. There are two clamps, one on each side, that need to be carefully pulled back, and then the Z button can slide right out. The rubber button is rather loose on it, so just be careful not to damage anything or lose the rubber overlay. With that gone, the analog assembly needs to be disconnected, carefully. I recommend using your fingernails to gently pry it up a little on each side until it's loose enough to pull out. And of course, there are more screws to unscrew. There are three more that attach the analog assembly to the controller itself. And now, here it is, the analog assembly, apart from the controller. I admit I never realized that the well here wasn't part of the controller casing. But enough of that, there's still one more screw to unscrew, and that's the one holding the two halves of the analog assembly together. But be careful, because the analog stick is spring-loaded and just ready to pop out on you once you let go of its restraints. Here's where all the magic happens. Oh, my, th this is embarrassing. It looks like someone left a stash of cocaine in my N64 controller. No wonder it doesn't work so well anymore. Actually, as you probably long figured out, ever since you saw it in the analog well, this is actually from the control stick as it wears itself down and becomes loose. I just never expected to find nearly this much of it. The first controller of mine I worked on was my EXTREME GREEN controller, and just look at all the dust that was in it. So all this needs to be dismantled and cleaned. The analog assembly contains the stick itself, the spring, a vertical motion bar, and a horizontal motion bar, and the actual circuitry. So take it all apart and clean it up nice. Once all that is gone, we can now begin to see how exactly the control stick works. Apparently this functions in a much different way from any other modern control stick. Those use a device called a potentiometer to determine location and movement. The Nintendo 64 actually works much more like a traditional computer mouse. The horizontal and vertical bars I mentioned earlier are attached to both a control stick and a gear on each side. As the stick moves, it turns the gears, where light-emitting diodes, 
No, not the ones the wizard uses to read people's minds, thank goodness, but can you imagine a control stick that did? Man, I gotta get my hands on some of this 1940s technology. Wait, where was I? Oh yes, LEDs track the movement using a shutter effect and give out a digital reading of position back to the controller, which means the analog stick isn't technically analog at all. The problem, however, are the motion bars. The control stick wears against them, shaving off all that controller dust and eventually making the stick thinner. Can you see how that affects gameplay? When you're moving the control stick, the analog well gives you a clear boundary of how far you can push the stick, which is supposed to be the extent of the available movement of the motion bars. But when the stick is too small for the bars, it takes more pushing for the stick to make contact with them, so you reach the edge of your available movement before the motion bars can reach their limit. So that makes it more difficult to make precise movements like aiming a bow and arrow in Zelda, and it also makes running at top speed nearly impossible. Unfortunately, when it comes to the Nintendo 64's controller, it is the size of the boat rather than the motion of the ocean. Fortunately, all you have to do to make the experience more stimulating is with natural stick enhancement, and there's no prescription required. I'm talking about tape. Different people will recommend different types of tape. Thicker tapes will be easier to work with, while thinner tapes will give you more control over making subtle corrections. Now what you need to do is cut a strip of tape that's as wide as these two spots on the control stick. The needed length will vary based on how worn down your stick is. Cutting tape this thin, especially scotch tape, is extremely tedious work, hence why I cut mine off camera. And as you can see, I have a really difficult time cutting in a straight line. And this is the one huge area where scotch tape is at a disadvantage, especially the clear, shiny finish which makes it almost impossible to see. If you're using scotch tape, I definitely recommend a matte finish to it. My advice is to err on the side of too thin, as you can always overlap places you missed on the first loop to even it out. So with two strips of tape completed, just wrap each one around one of the spots. With the cleaning and taping done, your analog assembly should be ready to, well, reassemble. Make sure your motion bars are put in so they fit in with the gears. As I said earlier, it's the gears that actually detect the movement, so making sure they can get input is of the utmost importance. Now, before you start screwing everything back together, give the control stick a good shakedown to see if it feels how you want it to. If it still feels loose, you might want to try more tape. If the stick won't recenter itself automatically or is very slow in doing so, you use too much. As you can see here, it sticks in vertical movement, so I'll have to remove some tape on that part. The key is to make the motion bars just snug enough. On my red controller, it seemed the vertical movement didn't need any help at all, but I put one layer of tape around it because I'd rather it get worn through than the control stick itself. I should also mention that I've heard advice against using electrical tape as it doesn't stick very well. Once the control stick feels like it should, all there is to do is to put it back together again. Lots of screws, wires, don't forget your L, R, and Z buttons, and then finally the casing. And here's where that magnetic screwdriver comes in handy for the expansion port. And I admit, I was worried about using a magnet, even one as weak as the one on the screwdriver, on this expansion port, but I did test out my rumble pack afterwards, and it works perfectly fine, so it shouldn't be a problem. And there you have it, your controller should be functioning much better. Maybe not perfect, but much tighter than it was before. And practice makes perfect. Each controller I've done has been much better than the previous one. I'm by no means an expert on the subject, though, but I hope you learned something. If you have any tips or tricks I didn't mention, or you just want to share your N64 controller repair experience, please leave any of those in the comments section. Until then, I'll see you next time in Batman Part 3.
Uh, well, now that it's out, I can enjoy a wonderful game of Super Mario 64, 64 or, the or The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, or, or how about, or how about Donkey, Donkey Kong 64? 64.